But he is a leader who led all the sorties from the front. Every sortie he led himself. Fantastic person. Fantastic. Absolutely. We had a very good deal. So, as I was team. saying that, uh, yes, you must have. Because he is he's wonderful. He's a wonderful human being. He's a wonderful... I met, I met him uh, personally. He has a wonderful yeah. ability to... to, to uh, he wonderful to... ability to say and, and explain whatever it is. A very patient yeah. man. So, we've held all of them in extremely high respect and uh, learned a lot. So, in 28th Squadron was our first move into uh, the operational side. And here, I must mention very clearly, our grooming was not only in the flying that we were getting and we got in OTO in Jamnagar and what we started getting in uh, Tezpur. The other part of it was on the technical side and what is involved in knowing about the aeroplane you're going to fly. So, we were told in the crew room that there's no, you can't sit in the crew room and smoke cigarettes. You please go to the tarmac, go to the hangar, go to the DSS, go to the RNS, learn about the systems, learn about the hydraulics, the pneumatics, the whatever the thing is, learn about it. And my pile, my notes and, and stuff like that. So, our grooming was also there on uh, what it, what the technical side is involved in making the aeroplane fly. Exactly. And we had this fantastic chiefy, chiefy, a flight sergeant, uh, DP Singh. I don't know, some of the people in this uh, forum would have come across chiefy DP Singh. He was in the armament trade. He was from the armament trade and he was a national wrestler. So national wrestler means he was solid. He had this crew cut hair and they get crushed in wrestling and all that. So he was like that tough customer, but a man of the heart, big hearted gentleman and very tough with the men. So, and very tough with the officers. So we were pilot officers and uh, we would go to the aeroplane to fly and supposing you got into the cockpit or you did the external and you did something happened in the startup, something went wrong, you didn't found something unserviceable and you started walking back from the aircraft to the DSS, you never reached the DSS. Chief DP Singh would reach you first. While he would give you the respect as an officer, he also expected the respect from you in return, which we gave him because we were so scared of him actually. And uh, so he would say, sir, what's the problem? And you tell him, chiefy, you know, he would not let you go back to the crew room. He'll say, sir, you can't go back to the crew room. So please go and sit under the wing in that heat in the sun. Uh, but you sit under the wing, I will get it repaired, I will get it sorted out and rectified and you will fly the sortie. You will not go back. I mean, he was, and he was like that. And he would himself, as an armament trade, I, you would find him inside the jet pipe of the of the aircraft, inside the tail, helping the engines tradesman doing something. He is in the cockpit, helping the instrument tradesman doing something. He, I mean, he was an amazing chiefy. And for us, I mean, we saw Chiefy DP saying it was it was something. I mean, I I can never forget the man. He was he had this aura about him, which was so fantastic. Which was I mean, like they say all pervasive. He just covered the squadron with in all the aspects of it's sad flying, that they are uh, Chiefy the concept alone. Everything later the Chiefy, <laughs> you know, the Chiefy concept uh, went out. The Air Force we didn't have any Chiefy. Yeah, uh, I remember we in our time also had a Chiefy flight sergeant. He was the boss of the DSS. Everything happens under the chief. Yes. So anyhow, I, I was there for a year and three months in the 28th Squadron and we got our status, certain amount of flying status and we moved on to our operational squadron and uh, I went to three squadron and uh, had a long tenure there for four years. So that was my large part of my MiG-21 flying in three squadron, in 28 and three squadron. And from there to the flying instructor school, did my became a qualified flying instructor. And six months later, in uh, December of seventy nine, I uh, December of seventy eight, sorry, I I went to the Air Force Academy, the same place where we were the first course. I was back there as an instructor in nineteen seventy eight, and uh, that was seven years after we inaugurated the institution. And uh, I served at AFA. Did it change? Did it change much from the time? You were flight cadets 
to the time you instruct them? Yes, yes. AFA was growing all the time. It still is. And uh, there were lots of improvement. There was uh, another building which had come up. The officer's mess had come up. Uh, officer's quarters had come up. The men's accommodation had increased tremendously. The warrant of the SNCO's accommodation had increased tremendously. A shopping complex was there. You could uh, go to town. You could get a bus to go to town. When we, when we were there, we would take a cycle, go till the gate and leave the cycle okay. in the guard room. And okay. then uh, and take a lift from these trucks. Sometimes, you know, Bajriwala truck and some... Uh, all sorts of truck, sabji, carrying sabji and all that into town. And you went into Hyderabad, Secunderabad on those trucks and you didn't know how to get back. It was a problem at night. So, you know, it was, and it was all jungle those days. Today, there's habitation all the way through. Absolutely. You can't see any jungle in between. But that time, it was pitch dark, not a single street light for 30 kilometers all the way to Hyderabad, Secunderabad. So, it was pretty dangerous. I mean, it looked pretty dangerous. And... I think those days, uh, the decoyed Viru and all was not there. Pirapad. Those days. <laughs> so, anyhow. In our, uh, in our time, so I think AFA, officers, yeah. in our time, I think officers right. also, uh, instructors also stayed in the killer smiths. There, uh, there was no officer smiths. That was 72. They were still there. Yes, it took some time to come up to the house. And uh, so, uh, two years, and as Dave had said that I had this incident of an engine seizure on a Kiran. Uh, it was a it was a routine uh, training sortie. I had a cadet with me on board, and uh, we went up. All the sectors were occupied. There were about eight, ten sectors, and uh, all of them had aircraft in it already, with the instructors or solo or whatever. So ours was a very gentle sort of a sortie. It was instrument flying or some simple sortie. So they sent me over Hyderabad, Secunderabad, which was a I don't know flying from those uh, airliners flying at that time. So they sent me there. And uh, I was at, I think, 15 or 17,000 feet when I had the seizure. And what really happened was that we were just flying straight and level doing nothing. I mean, the, the boy was practicing, the cadet was practicing something. And uh, I was teaching him. And there was this very loud grinding sound, which I had never heard most unnatural in the cockpit. And then the grinding noise stopped and there was deathly silence. And I realized that the engine had gone. But in what respect, for a moment, I didn't realize till I looked inside. And I saw my RPM going to zero and my oil pressure going to zero and the jet pipe temperature coming down rapidly and which finally also went to zero subsequently. And I realized what had happened. Because you don't get these things going to zero, which uh, Dave and the other pilots will understand that uh, you've had a seizure at that stage. So I turned around immediately towards the airfield. Uh, fortunately, you flying over the city that time. Oh, yes. In fact, I was actually a little uh, just beyond Tangband for those uh, familiar oh, in my. Hyderabad. Center of the city. Both. And uh, so. I, Central of the city, in fact, a little more towards Hyderabad, I mean, further away from the airfield. So, it took a little time to get back, but whatever. And uh, so, I turned around and I gave a call to the ADC and I told them uh, I've had an engine seizure. So, there was a little pause, silence on the RT. And then uh, the ADC said, confirm engine failure. Because engine seizure is something one doesn't hear on the RT. You know, it's, it's a very rare phenomenon in flying in the Air Force and otherwise uh, you, you rarely hear it. And uh, so I said uh, negative, I've had an engine seizure. So now there was silence from the other side and uh, because uh, they, they didn't know what to do under the circumstances. And uh, then the duty pilot, there's always a duty pilot in the ATC. The duty pilot came on and he said, uh, Mukho, what's the problem? I said, sir, this is the problem. I've got an engine seizure. What are the parameters? I said, this is what has happened, zero, zero, zero. So he said, okay. So he said, uh, at a convenient time, uh, he said, your position. And those days, we didn't have radars there in AFA. Radar was there. I don't know whether it was on that day or not. But uh, so he asked me position. I told him so and so. I'm heading back to his base. And uh, then he told me, when convenient, eject. Because I think all the pilots who have flown jets uh, will understand that in our emergency booklet that we get for any uh, air, a jet aircraft, more, all, almost all the jet aircraft, the only action for uh, engine seizure is 
injection so inject so he told me inject i said okay and uh, then slowly other systems started to pack up and i realized that i'm going to lose everything very shortly so you have an emergency mechanical lever to lower the wheels so the undercarriage and i used that lever and lowered my undercarriage so my undercarriage came down and while i still had electrical power because elect- the electrical power also went subsequently and uh, the battery was still available so i got my three greens so i knew my wheels were down and locked so i was in that position now and heading back towards base the problem was that uh, for those who are not aware we, these aircraft which have certain amount of glide properties they can fly even with a windmilling engine that means an engine failure and i think i'll just give a small explanation of difference between the engine failure and an engine seizure for anybody who may want to ask when you have an engine failure the engine is still windmilling and there is some sort of latent thrust which is there uh, which is uh, available and uh, which gives you some sort of a glide property uh, but uh, in uh, the case of a seizure the, the compressor blades are totally stopped there is no windmilling of the engine it's totally stopped and it's like a flat plate in the airflow or say when you're swimming in the water and you you know just put your hand like that and go it's flat and uh, so it it is only resistance or drag and nothing else so with the result is now descending at an extremely rapid rate and uh, so it it was what, what was the rate of descent if you don't remember i don't remember the rate of descent but i know it was at least one and a half times More than... almost two times normal rate of descent in a glide so and i looked at my height I, the, the only action was the ejection anyhow so i told this boy i said look i'm going to try and make it back i don't know i have never done it nobody has ever done it because this was the first case of engine seizure in on a kiran uh, so i was calling out what was happening in the cockpit so that yeah. the atc atc would note down and as and when the system started to fail i had about 6 or 7 failures that happened in the cockpit one by one and then finally the battery battery went dead the battery went dead which is nice because i started getting a lot of instructions from people who were on the rt to say the mukho do this mukho do that <laughs> and uh, i think i was getting too many instructions from people when the ba- battery went dead i uh, i was very fortunate I was all silent in the cockpit just my cadet and me talking to each other so that's all and i told him i said son this has not been done before and i'm going to try it agar kahin galti ho gayi i will know i'm going wrong i will tell you eject you please eject because as a rule as a tradition the instructor will make sure that the cadet leaves first in a cockpit uh, where the, there is no command ejection i think a lot of people would have been on an aircraft which have command ejection that means in a two seat trainer one man pulls the handle the canopy will go one seat will go second seat both seats go all that will happen there there was no command ejection on the kiran the canopy had to be sent first and then one seat at a time by the individual himself so could could you talk to him in intercom the intercom was working or just voice once the battery had gone even the intercom the went intercom went so you could just talk to him uh, across lucky he you are sitting side by side and by side so i'll just show an aircraft from kiran those who don't know probably what kiran is this is the kiran can you see sir the kiran is see but this is a similar aircraft same get back so as i was saying that uh, in our training uh, we practice for a force landing that means bringing the aircraft back with a failed engine if you run out of fuel or something and the engine fails there's a way of bringing the aircraft back there's a pattern that we fly to bring the mm-hmm. aircraft back and uh, i try to follow that pattern and i realize i can't because it would not work uh, the rate of descent was so high so i was doing a pattern which was totally my own by instinct by feel by experience and my experience was how much just 7 years of of service at that time and i had a responsibility of a cadet on board so so i made him practice the ejection drill four times that young boy was i mean he i gave him the confidence that uh, bache you have to go when i tell you to go because i can't wait very long and uh, he said yes sir i i will do it and uh, so we went through this thing and as i came on the final approach for landing when i was very sure that i've got everything with me 
and I was going to make the runway. I had one more option with me, which was the flaps. And it was a one position flap, which was the full flap. So the Kiran has got an hydraulic accumulator, which gives you one operation of the flap. And I decided to select that operation. I selected the flap. And when I selected the flap, it again creates a lot of drag also. And aircraft started to sink like a stone, absolutely. And I said, Galti Hawaii, I made a mistake and I thought I'll never make the runway. But I made the runway. I got oh, just God. about 100 feet in the runway. And the aircraft stopped because there was no engine. The engine, uh, the aircraft stopped within another 300 feet and just stopped her and so on. So by now, the ATC crash tender was, was coming on the way. The, the CI and the Jeep were coming and uh, a lot of instructors on motorbikes and all that coming and uh, so when i got out of the aircraft and uh, we went and looked at the jet pipe we found that the jet pipe was full of iron and iron filing you know as though something is like a lathe machine you know when you go put something through a lathe machine so when what had happened is for those who are familiar the the single engine of the kiran has got three mounting bolts top and out of those three mounting bolts broken they're sheared off all the so, bolts all three bolts or there were three one, bolts two of them two of them broke two probably one yeah. broke and with that break with the other one other also broken. Broken. Uh, so the engine sank by about eight inches or ten inches or something it, it sank in its housing and then it started to eat up all the the body the fuselage the inside the pipelines everything and there was no indication well, of fire no indication of fire at all fire indication didn't come wow. i was very lucky so it started to eat up while it was stopping so in those few rotations before it stopped it uh, chewed up the insides of the aircraft so it was full of all these metal pieces and filing and all that in that inside the aircraft in the jet pipe so i was given a pat in the back and i told shabash and all that and my cadet i was more worried about my cadet poor guy he was shaking he was very scared but uh, he was happy that he was back and uh, the cadet went on to do very well and he became a mirage pilot oh, what is his name uh, became the senior flight commander himanshu mohan oh i see Okay. Uh, he became a, a Mirage pilot, did very well for himself, uh, but he elected to leave the service on his own, became an airline pilot thereafter. As a squad leader, he left as a squad leader. And, uh, Is he still in touch with you? Yes. We are off and on. We are in touch. And thanks to the connectivity and all that that we have today. Oh. So we, we, we do keep in touch now. now. Must be some, some experience for him, aren't you? <laughs> Yes, uh, but uh, yes, it was it was an experience of a lifetime, and uh, so I think I was lucky again that uh, whatever I tried, I did it worked, and it uh, it was intuition bringing that aircraft back and following a pattern which was totally you are being I mean, very you are being very uh, new new thing you are being very very modest, Savit sir. It, no, it, it, it's it it's fantastic amount of lines can to bring that aircraft. With seas and zins, with so much of rate of descent, it made it to the uh, runway with just 100 feet. Oh, it was tremendous. I actually, I wanted the audience to hear that. It was an incredible story. I don't think anyone else would have done it. I don't feel, I feel it, it was a extremely well, I mean, really well deserved Saudi Achaka, really. So, uh, in fact, uh, after that, that was in the, in the month of May in 1980. And uh, I didn't know whether they had put me up for an award and all award and all that. I I wasn't aware. And I ca continued with my work. And I was posted out uh, in January of '81. And uh, my son had just been born, so I was moving to Tezpur to eight squadron. And there were three of us moving uh, to Tezpur. Uh, Rajaram, who was going to a Nat squadron. Dhiraj Kukreja who was moving to 30 squadron and me, we I was moving to 8 squadron. We three of us in the train and of course uh, Kukreja's wife was there. And uh, so four of us, we were traveling the train and heading out to via Calcutta to Tezpur and Bagdogra. This one, Rajaram was going to Bagdogra or Hashimara. So at Vijayawada, when uh, there's a long stop, we were waiting for some train crossing and there's a long wait or for the train. I had gone out on the platform to, you know, get some, some chai for everyone in Pakoras and smoke my cigarette, all that. And uh, I came back and they told me, hey, Mooks, congratulations. So I said, for what? And they said, your name is there in the awards list and you've got a shorty chuck. So I, I was very surprised. I didn't know that I had been put up for an award and 
I was truly uh, honored that uh, they considered me uh, worthy of it. And uh, so that is how I got to Shorya Chakra. And uh, well, we continued in the train and I, we were carrying the bottle of rum. So I think we had, we had one extra that, that evening to enjoy ourselves and, and you know, celebrate the occasion. And uh, then we were in Tejpur. Tejpur was a short tenure, uh, just one year, because by then the MiG-25s came in and uh, I went to the MiG-25. But uh, I, I'll say one more thing, uh, although uh, some people may find it uh, a little uh, strange and uh, maybe amusing. You know, for uh, us, when we fill in the annual confidential report, while we don't get to see our, what, what has been filled in for us, but the initial thing, you fill in all the details of Inam number and all that and whatever. And there is one column which says the choice of next posting. You, know, you always ask you know, for a choice. And uh, all the time people, you know, ask for choices of aircraft or a squadron or a place that I may be given, uh, posted to so-and-so place. Or those days the new aircraft, uh, or some new aircraft would just come in. So you say, I want to go to them. But typical of peace staff and typical, I think, of AFR also for the other. Nobody seemed to get the posting that he asked for in his, in his ACR. <laughs> Or whatever you made a request. You were the AOP so, leader. And I was the AOP leader. Did, did you change that? So, it, so I mean, we'll discuss that later. But the thing <laughs> is, that it was it was a standard joke that, you know, peace staff doesn't uh, believe in anything. They, they do what they feel like. Can you be posting karado? Can you be posting karado? Uh, one day notice and two days notice and yahan se wahan chale jao and nikobar east west anything you ask for the east they send you west you know those were the that was a joke that was going on so i think it was an afa once you know i wrote when they asked for choice you get two choices so i wrote a and b the two choices i wrote to fly faster and b was to fly even faster now the joke was on me because I was posted to MiG-25 which was flying even faster. And I don't think P-Staff read my note because that was a very naughty way of putting it across. They had taken uh, offense to that. But I did get to fly even faster on the MiG-25. Well, now on the MiG-25, we got 10-15 minutes. So... We'll give you some more time. I, I hope the people are, are not too bored. And uh, so on the MiG-25, uh, I was stood there. I found my instructor there as the first, uh, he, as a CEO. I was the first Indian. They called me the first Indian. Why? Because the team that was there was a team that had gone to Russia to bring the airplane and do their training. So I was the first person to be trained on the MiG-25 in India. So I was called the first Indian. And the first Indian, so when I went there, so the big, now the celebration had to be done to the STO there was later on AVM uh, Chima and uh, so Chima said his baptism has to be done by the technicians. So they took me to the DSS and so there I was again after CP DP Singh's time and here I was again you know put into a situation in the DSS where uh, of course the DSS was that time manned by the Russians because the aircraft was still being assembled and put up for flying and you know the new aircraft were all being uh, built up there. So the Russian chap, he was told Russian, and I found that in my in that squadron, everybody was Russia trained, so everybody knew Russian language, and I was the only guy who did not know the language. Anyhow, so they told me that uh, you have to join the, the MiG-25, you will have to be baptized for joining the aircraft by having spirit, techniski spirit, techniski spirit is technician's spirit, which is alcohol. Now, most people who've been on these fighter aircraft know that all the avionics based on fighter aircraft are cooled with alcohol. And you have this small bottle which sprays alcohol in the system to keep them cool at uh, high speeds and high temperature conditions. The MiG-25 for the profile that it flew was had an alcohol tank which contained 200 liters of alcohol. So for that 200 liters of alcohol, when you top up the refueling, uh, you top up the alcohol you need a bowser. You can't do it with hand. 200 liters, there was alcohol. And so I was given one cap full of that bottle. He is copilo as crack down the hatch. And I drank it as being baptized. And uh, I have never had liquor like that in my life. It was burnt. It burnt and burnt down my throat. But that was my initiation into the MiG 25. And uh, so now I, I was allowed to do whatever, you know, start my ground subjects. And, and start by flying thereafter. 
So that was the initiation into uh, the squadron. Is it the trainer? Yeah. Uh, yes. So we started with ground subjects. Uh, three weeks of ground subjects, like we go through in all the aircraft. And I was the only student in the class, and I had the warrant officers and sergeants teaching me. And all the systems, we learned all the systems, and then we got on to the flying part. And two-seater trainer, which uh, I think they will show you some photographs of the uh, trainer. It was the most unusual sort of a trainer. The design was very different to most airplanes anywhere in the world. So you can see uh, the two cockpits, one behind the other, but one above the other also. So it's a very strange looking configuration. But surprisingly, what happens is, and normally in all these uh, fighter aircraft, the trainee is sitting in front and the instructor is at the back. But on the MiG-25, it was the trainee at the back and the instructor in the front. Because what it was, at the trainer literally, was a fighter aircraft which, from which the camera had been removed and they put a co cockpit in its place. So, and they made the canopy, which was the same as the top canopy. But when you sat at the back and you look in front, the canopy was like part of the nose. So it was as if you're sitting in a fighter. So the transition to the, the single seater was no problem at all because you were sitting in the same configuration as you trained and then you flew solo in the fighter aircraft or the, or the single seater. So that's the two seater you can see uh, the MiG-25. Uh, the MiG-25, I think, uh, as he said, was an enigma. 90% uh, or more of the Indian Air Force, whether it be the officers, whether it be the men, whether it be anybody, didn't actually see the aeroplane. So it was never shown in public. So it, it was big, the massive, it had so much of power and it was a secret unit. It was called it was called one or two operational unit when we joined. So it, it it was a big powerful aeroplane which operated in secrecy. And our missions were what you call covert missions. That means uh, nobody was to know. And missions were in peacetime, more or less. And uh, so uh, the aircraft, as I said, people didn't get to see it. Nobody was allowed to see it. We had double fencing around the squadron. And there were guard dogs that we had in the unit. And uh, that is uh, Alsatian uh, dogs and uh, Labrador dogs. Labrador were trackers. And the Alsatian guard dogs who would roam around, we had these handlers, guard, uh, dog handlers, especially only for the squad. So we had a kennel for the dogs inside the this thing. And they were like these police dogs. You know, they perform all sorts of tricks and all that. And uh, so it was secret, not allowed, nobody allowed to see. But like the first, the chief at that time was Air Chief Marshal Latif, and he came to fly. And uh, he sort of inaugurated, uh, he did the inauguration of the aircraft in, into the Indian Air Force. And he has flown in, in that aircraft with the, with the CO. And uh, thereafter, a couple of chiefs have flown. In fact, the, the best thing was uh, the familiarity of the mix for all those people who have flown mix, whether it be the MiG-21, the 23, the 25, 27, 29. When you're in a Russian cockpit, the orientation is so natural, it's so common to all that you don't feel out of place. So when I came from the MiG-21 to the MiG-25, it was it was a simple transition. As far as orientation of the cockpit is concerned, there's no problem. And uh, in fact, one of our chiefs, and that was Dennis Lafontaine, who came to see the aircraft and uh, he climbed up the ladder and he looked inside and then he stepped in and sat down and he says I say all this is very familiar because he's an old MiG-21 hand so he said all this is very familiar and then he said damn it it even smells the same so the smell of a Russian aircraft the smell of the cockpit That's you know of whether it's the instruments, the sweat, whatever it is, it's all very, very familiar with those people who have flown Russian aircraft. And then we had this fantastic set of technicians. The the numbers who went uh, to Russia for training, there were six pilots and 10 technical officers. And this gang of men who had gone from all the various trades. And there were some very complex trades like the photo and the, the elint. And uh, so it was not only photo reconnaissance, it also did electronic intelligence. And there were some very specialized technicians that were there in the unit. And we would have doubts anytime on any system. We would go and talk to them in the section. And uh, there was so much to learn all the time. And for us, it was great learning value. It didn't matter that whether we the pilots or the, we became the flight commander or the CEO. Every time you talk to some of the technicians who worked hands-on on the system, you, you could figure out that this is what 
system is all about may interrupt so yeah. it uh, and i was told that uh, indian air force is the only uh, air force that russians permitted for independent uh, handling of the aircraft operation of the aircraft no other country they permitted including egypt is it true they did give it later on to uh...